if you're on Facebook uh, and Zoom, uh, if you're willing to share our live stream real quick, that would be great. Uh, we are live on Facebook now, so uh, we'll give everybody a minute to uh, join us on on Facebook. Appreciate everybody joining us though on the Zoom channel today. We're going to talk about how we can do solar for all in Delaware. Maybe learn some lessons. <laughs> our host, our guest here today, Jeffrey Richardson, is quite the knowledgeable individual on solar programs and so we're going to pick his brain a little bit uh, give everybody just another second to uh join us on facebook i know we're starting a little bit late on for those on facebook i apologize they changed up the the process on me on how you go live and still still getting used to it so i appreciate everybody's patience and uh who, the people are jumping on now i see uh so well, let's go ahead and get started. As usual, I am your host, uh, Dustin Thompson from the Delaware Sierra Club. And with me today is the wonderful, the fabulous, the magical Jeffrey Richardson. Oh, man, we're in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey, why don't you give everybody just a little bit of background about yourself and, of course, the beautiful company, Amani Energy. Okay. Um, so, Jeffrey Richardson, and born and raised in Pittsburgh, PA, and, uh, you know, really, I got involved with this work in not in a direct line. Um, as a journalist, my back, training and education, I have a degree in journalism, bachelor's degree in journalism. I did work as a professional journalist, one of the oldest uh, historically backed papers in the country, the Pittsburgh Courier. I have a master's degree in philosophy. And um, so with those two uh, degrees, I worked as a journalist. And then going from journalism, I moved into joint organizing, kind of different change. Um, working with something called the Jobs with Peace Campaign. This is in the uh, mid eighties, the Jobs with Peace Campaign. Did my training out in South Central Los Angeles, came back to Pittsburgh, PA, became the organizer and the director there. We did a massive campaign out there, about 129,000 signatures, putting a big issue on the ballot, dealing with something we could talk about today, which is reducing excessive and wasteful military spending to get more money for housing, education, health care, and basic human needs. That's what we would say on the street many, many times. Um, so that was my entry into, into organizing. So I come even to the business from organizing, but spending a long time working in communities to address issues of social justice, which also is part of what I saw growing up in a African-American community in Pittsburgh through the 60s, et cetera, and seeing what that was, the impact of that on my life. Um, and so that's my educational experience. And I've worked in the community economic development. I've worked at Washington, D.C. in community economic development for a national organization. I've been the director for the uh, speaker of the California State Assembly, Karen Bass. We started out as organizers. Now she's a U.S. Congresswoman, but we work together as organizers then. Um, I work for SEIU as a labor organizer. And um, that was SEIU Local 1877 in Los Angeles, working in a union. Uh, working with um, basically security officers and also janitors. So you had a largely Spanish speaking janitors population there at the union. And then the security officers are largely African-American. They're the ones that stand in the office buildings. Um, all of them were very low wage workers and our fight was to get them decent wages there. So all those experiences combined and then working with the social justice foundation called the Liberty Hill Foundation out in California uh, coming back here now in education, I teach at the University of Delaware in Africana Studies. But along many years of working as a community organizer, I'll talk more about that as we move forward. But it was in my experience in Los Angeles that I first got involved with solar, having had a background in community economic development, and always looking for ways to address the issues of the disproportionate um, distribution of resources and exclusion principally of low-income people, people of color, and specifically of African-Americans from the economy and what that has done to communities in terms of essentially destroying uh, communities. So that experience informed my approach to solar. And so working with the group early in 2006 and learning about solar, uh, after several years, we formed Imani Energy. And that was in 2008, incorporated in 2009 in California 
and the mining energy is formed specifically to address the needs of low income and people of color to expand opportunities for low income and people of color communities in the solar arena and to do this in a way that is good for the economy, which is equity and for the environment. And so our, our focus there is trying to ensure to the extent that we can to make our contribution so that what happens and what happened with the dot-com boom in this country where you had technology essentially bypassing low income and people of color communities, that we can be at least one of the voices out here working as a company to do projects that are connected to communities where communities are put first where people of color are put first, their needs, their interests first to expand opportunities within a very fast growing solar industry. So that's our, our company. We're rooted in and it's in our DNA. We were formed for this, not something that we added on. But we came to this through working for social economic justice, looking at solar as one of the vehicles through which to achieve that goal. While we also are working to strengthen, to heal the environment and to bring to this business because we are a social mission driven business, a social mission driven business. So that our focus is on all of the aspects of improving the community and growing the business, but first focusing on the people, not just the profits first and only, but the people first. So um, I'm glad to say that we have a member of our board member, a board member who is, um, actually former board chair of a company called Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream, which I'm sure you know. She's currently on the board. She's personal friend, but she's on the board of Imani Energy. Um, and so I've learned a lot working with her, a, a great friend, African-American woman, um, just about the work of Ben and Jerry's and how they've worked to maintain their focus on a social mission. Um, so that's informed our work as well. And we have other board members. One is a PhD from Caltech, has patents on battery storage. So that's a little bit about the company, why we exist, the communities that we serve, and specifically what we do in terms of the technical aspect of this. We manage and develop solar projects. We help to identify and source financing for solar projects. And we also are a reseller of the components of solar power systems, the modules, the balance of system components, et cetera. And uh, we've also moved to do more in the area of education, specifically STEM education, and I can talk more about that with one of the projects that we're working on now. And so that's a little bit about Imani Energy. Um, yeah. We moved here in 2013 and kind of really set a face, if you would say, in Delaware in 2013 when I came here from California. So uh, given your, your background, and we're going to dive into a number of the things that uh, uh, you talked about there. Yeah. Uh, but what have been some of the issues with equity in this particular marketplace and with accessing solar that, that you've had to deal with uh, in the past? Yeah, you're saying this marketplace, U.S., specifically Delaware? Uh, let's, uh, well, just in your, in your background, it doesn't have to be specifically Delaware. Maybe okay. you can tie in some of the struggles you've had. Uh, elsewhere, but yeah, maybe maybe talk a little bit about what you've seen uh, in yeah. your time here, though. Okay, so I think that um, solar, like everything else, reflects the dynamics of our society. Um, it is an industry within uh, many other industries in our country, um, and so I think the issues of equity, access, are very real. They are highly racialized. I mean, that's part of the nature of our society why wealth is so significantly imbalanced in this country and the world actually and um so i was on a call not that long ago with um two african-american women one of them has like two mbas from the top schools in the country she works in the area of dealing with capital and working to get capital to businesses uh, particularly with uh, people of color businesses but like if i remember this correctly don't quote me but it's about like 97 percent of the major firms that deal with capital and the dispersal of capital are, are basically controlled by white folks, almost like white men, almost exclusively, not totally, but significantly. So that gives you some picture of like what people of color businesses and black businesses specifically in America are up against when they work to access capital to do work. So that's just from a general business perspective. 
we won't even talk about just as a progressive business, you know, the same dynamics exist. And sometimes they can be even more difficult. So that's one element of the overall economy and the politics of, of our economy. Um, the other thing is, is because of that, that lack of access, it creates more barriers and hurdles to get and start a business, which all businesses have hurdles. It's not easy to do any business. Um, but I think those are complicated and compounded um, dramatically uh, if you're a person of color um, because you're talking about networks and access to resources. And if you know about, which I'm sure you do in this very educated audience about the inequalities in our economy in terms of wealth distribution in America, you can see the challenges that many businesses have. And if you come from a background like I did, I mean, we went through, we were educated. Everybody in our family has a degree or two, a brother has a PhD, one sister with two, you know, master's degree, et cetera, et cetera. So my family really pushed education, but we weren't wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. So any community that you come from and a family where you don't have wealth, things like borrow from your family, they tell you to go borrow from your family members and friends to get started up in the business. You're like, okay. And you talk to people that say, well, I started, I had a, Got a hundred thousand, got fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollars together. Well, most the people I grew up with don't have that kind of money. So those are kind of dynamics just on the ground. Even when you go to conferences and they give you the first steps, you see the that is there's a disconnect between that and the reality of many people. Now there are some that can do that, absolutely, and do. And those are not hurdles that you let stop you, but those are just reality. And they're just compounded. And this would be the same for principally even a working class white family or a poor white family would have some of those same dynamics. They may be able to, because of the fact that they are white, enter into networks and develop relationships to move, but they don't have those in their families either. And I went to school at Ohio University, which is in Appalachia. And so there I had an experience to meet very poor white folks. As I know there's a lot of white folks who also don't have those kind of connections which you need. So that's just one really just practical thing. Um, the other thing is, just the whole uh, dynamic of creating an environment where there's some real concern about, and now I'm talking about specifically about Delaware, um, renewable energy, a green economy, and a consciousness of a green economy, and having that to be more widespread. Um, and that's something that has to be developed. And you're doing it with the Sierra Club and other groups to developing the consciousness in people of this heightened concern for the environment, but also looking at very specific ways to actualize that uh, in programs, in policy, et cetera. Um, and I would think the political environment, because of the influence of fossil fuel industries here and across the country and the world, um, there's barriers to that. And they have a lot of capability to <clears throat> give people information that creates a lot of dissonance in the communication channel that makes it difficult for them to understand the importance of this and also that that it's doable and possible. Um, so I think that's in the fact that um, in this environment, the need for consistent policies that open up solar and with specific carve outs for low income communities as well and people of color communities and industry. And um, so I think those are some of the, the, the barriers uh, to get started, just the key hurdles. Um, yeah, just a few. Yeah, so uh, you and I have had a, a number of conversations as well as how we can utilize solar to benefit communities, but not just in uh, clean, you know, sustainable energy uh, and cheaper electricity, honestly, yeah. solar, uh, but in employment as well. And that's, you know, one of your, uh, one of a constant theme of our conversation is how can we yeah. be equitable in, in our green economy. So how do you think that, how do you think we could do better on ensuring that we're driving this change to a, a green economy here in Delaware? Um, well, I think there's already so much great work like Sierra Club and other groups are doing. Uh, but I think, again, a lot of this gets back to policy as well. Um, so having been in California, which is like basically the largest solar market in the country and being out there at that period of time when solar was really expensive, it really was expensive and pretty much only people that had a lot of money could do it. But the prices have come down dramatically now. Uh, but they set the pace by putting in place policies and initiatives, programs to 
grow the solar market. And I think that's one of the things that we could do here. For instance, I know there's this whole focus on the RPS, which I'm honored to be a part of. I know you've been leading this charge. That's something obviously we have to move at the state level. But we had this discussion the other day about what can happen in, in municipalities. So at the same time we're moving statewide legislation, there are cities throughout Delaware. Why don't we have initiatives where we get cities to make commitments to go 100% renewable by X year and that they look at where do they get their electricity from? What is the source of their electricity? How much is coal and other sources? And then get them to commit to programs where they will move away from fossil fuel based electricity and power and move to renewables. Getting down at the granular level where they start looking at the buildings, the municipal buildings, looking at ways to power those with solar, looking at deploying energy efficiency in those buildings, starting with their own assets that they control, that they can make the decision around. That city council for that particular city can do that and then make this part of the city's program. And then we can look at goals. We can look at reductions over years. That's going to be a dollar amount. Some of those savings can go back to support some of the needs of the communities themselves. And that would mean the city is then leading the charge here and setting the pace, if you will. And that has an impact across the, the, whole, the whole city. And there are some cities across the country where they actually have programs like that, where the city is actively engaged and is a supporter, even economically, staffing programs where they act as a, um, a mediator, if you will, helping to aggregate um, different solar installers, uh, putting out proposals, and they work in tandem with communities where those projects are developed and to ensure that those projects are done in a way that benefits the communities. And then tied to that would be things like job creation programs and solar training programs, because it's very important to have training programs that are tied to a place for people to go to work. Um, years ago, I worked with a program called Youth Build in my hometown of Pittsburgh. Uh, we set that program up. We got some a small grant. Uh, it was a community development block grant that we got from the city community lobbying effort. Set this program up as part of a national program called Youth Build. And youth housing construction, they train um, youth. Many of them have had backgrounds and some um, experience being incarcerated. They come out, they get training, they do gut rehab housing, and they're able to then go in, get into unions, and do work, really very visible work. The same kind of thing can be done with solar. We increase the demand by actually reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, make the shift to renewables. Cities can do this with their own policies and then support training programs because I know there's gonna be some jobs because they're doing it and then encourage others in the city to do the same. So they can, they can do that. And there's actually financing available to do this. Um, Years ago, there was not as much money available to, to support this, but now the solar is growing and has grown. There are many different groups that are coming up now, and we have worked and developed networks with many of those entities over these years uh, to support this. So as cities are nonprofits and universities are nonprofits and schools are nonprofits and you have other nonprofit entities, et cetera, those entities can access these resources. So it's not even a, a situation where they have to come out of pocket or out of the taxpayers' pockets, if you will, to pay for these programs because the investors in those programs will put money up front because they feel that a city is a pretty reliable entity and they'll get their money back. That takes the upfront cost off of the back of the cities. They reduce their electricity cost and then they're able to do this over an extended period of time. And then they have additional resources they can put into meeting the needs of their constituents in that particular city. So those, those are things that we could do right now. We don't have to even have a policy change except for at the city level, but we should be able to get closer to those elected officials who are right in our city and right in our districts and say, here, this is what we want. We want our city to be a leader. And yeah, and if I, I got, I'll throw it out there. If anybody's watching, uh, we have a good audience on Facebook here as well. If anybody's watching, Sierra Club does have a Ready for 100 program where we can get funding uh, likely get funding to help uh, if anybody wants to help take charge of a really hyper-local initiative. Of course, the state organization doesn't um, uh, is focused a lot on state policy, uh, but if there's any local organizer or local groups or, or uh, volunteers that really want to work on that, uh, the city certainly uh, hopefully will be victorious in our state policies and maybe we can focus a little bit more on the cities. 
Yeah. Um, but if anybody wants to get a jump start on that, definitely reach out to me anytime uh, and I can help connect you with the right people. Um, so we have, uh, like I said, we do, we do have a, a quite a few people out watching with us on Facebook and we appreciate you uh, watching on Facebook. We did have one question uh, that came up and I think this flows a little bit into our next bit of our conversation, which was going to be about uh, community solar. Uh, so the question from Daniel was, uh, what are we doing with policy to make greener energy and products more affordable for all? Uh, underprivileged communities do not have the resources and money and outreach to get this done. This is a problem for all, not just the educated and richer communities. So I know, you know, last year we were talking about community solar. You have a program actually uh, that we're going to talk about with Imani uh, that possibly could help with this as well. I know you you don't work for the state, right? So you can't really speak to what the state's doing with policies, but just to throw out there, uh, community solar, I think, is is a large part of that. Outreach is the struggle of every good program. There's 100,000 best kept secrets of Delaware when it comes to, to programming, because outreach is often one of the more underfunded. You put a lot of money into the grant, into the program, and then not a lot of money into outreach. And there's just, there's kind of a wall that you hit when people also struggle to have access to broadband internet. Um, certainly working more with faith-based organizations and community organizations can help that. And the Sierra Club's trying to do its part, of course, as well with these live streams. Uh, we'll have uh, Tony DePrima on later this month to talk about the PACE program, which can help finance uh, renewable energy investment. And uh, next month, he's going to talk about the empowerment grants, which again are completely devised around helping uh, low and moderate income families. But Jeffrey, let, why don't we jump to what Amani Energy has going on to help people uh, with outreach and being able to afford these uh, products. So you have kind of a great deal that if if people want to help in this effort, right, but they also want to get solar themselves, why don't you uh, take it away from that? Well, great. Thank you very much, uh, Dustin. I um, Well, this this program, <clears throat> so we're looking at ways to encourage people to do solar. Um, at the end of the day, someone has to make a decision to do solar. We, we're working on some larger projects. I'll talk about a couple of those. Larger projects take a longer period of time uh, because there's more components to them, et cetera. But at an individual household level, an individual household hold owner can make a decision about doing solar. And a lot of it, it comes down clearly economics. Um, if people are concerned about the environment, many people are. Some people are just, I'll talk with people, it's just the money. That, that's fine. Okay, <laughs> but I'm concerned about the environment, all of that. Um, but the thing is that at the, the local level, looking at ways to encourage this and to help to do something very concrete, we've developed a program where if we can install 40 kW, 40 kilowatts of solar. So I'm just talking to a client, uh, has a really good uh, house, big roof. Uh, it's about a nine plus kW system. I just sent them a proposal just uh, actually this morning or yesterday. They're going to get their return in six years. They're going to save about 50 plus thousand dollars over this 20 or plus year period. Um, really great investment, great return for them. So for each one of those that we do up to 40, we get to 40 KW, we'll do a free system. We will do a free system for a low income resident of a three to four KW system. So if we achieve 40 KW, whatever combination, it could be five KW here, six KW there, eight KW there, six KW, but we get up to 40 KW. The first time we hit 40 KW, we'll do a free system of three to four KW, possibly five for a low income resident, right? So that'll be free. And we'll work with our community partners to identify low income residents. We won't do that. This group's already doing that, that have people that are qualified and qualify them, and then we can work to do that and provide a system. So this is the way that people who can afford to do solar, they get all the benefits of solar, they get the cost savings of solar, but they also can help someone get solar who can't afford it. And as you may know that people who have lower incomes pay a disproportionate share of their income to utility bills. So we think this can make a really, real difference. And um, if our first one comes through to that we just uh, started this discussion with. 
Uh, the site assessment is going to be done on Monday. So if this goes through, that'll be like nine that we, towards that 40 kW. Once we hit that, then we start another 40 kW. So that's what we're working on right now. Uh, so that program is, you're hearing it and it's lab and we're, we're, we're working to get that done. And um, in terms of other things we're doing, we actually have a project that was funded. We got a, a grant and to do a singular low-income household in the east side of Wilmington, where we'll employ education around energy efficiency and solar, based upon the experience also of the residents who then will have solar deployed at their house. And they'll be able to talk to residents about what they've experienced in the reduction in their electricity cost. So that it's not just us saying it, but the resident will be able to show their bills as a person in the community and help others to see how their bills have been reduced. And so this is a way to really start getting education to happen in the communities. And we're going to combine that with outreach. We were going to do this going out, getting people to come to a physical location. But obviously, given where we are now, we're going to be doing a lot of it online um, and, and until the situation changes. But that's, that's the, one of the other programs that we're working with. So this will be one of the pilots. We're looking at ways of extending that as well. Um, I could talk about the larger community solar program if you like now or I do that another time. What do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, com communities, because we can talk about, um, you know, Daniel actually also talked about some funding and how, uh, so TCI actually hasn't started, uh, that program hasn't started. He mentioned TCI, which is the Transportation Climate Initiative. Uh, REGI, which is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, that is where most of the uh, funding for a lot of the programs in Delaware uh, comes from. And uh, he mentions that there have been problems uh, getting the funding into the communities that need it the most. Um, certainly, uh, the Sustainable Energy Utility has done a lot of work with the REGI funds um, to help with and uh, the Weatherization Assistance Program as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, to help with uh, some of these things. But in terms of solar, uh, there, there is a lot of roadblocks uh, on the policy side and, and particularly with community solar. I think people need to understand that solar um, right now, what, for what we have right now, solar is one of the best ways to help reduce overall energy costs because it can be done uh, in such an affordable way. And I think community solar, once we're able to get this going, uh, can make a huge difference for, for communities that are struggling with high utility bills. Obviously, weatherization, energy efficiency is a massive part of this conversation. Uh, if you have just wind blowing in through your closed uh, window, obviously, we got we to gotta work on that. Uh, we're going to actually do a live stream on the weatherization program as well coming up soon. Stay tuned for that. Uh, but when it comes to, down to community solar, what you could possibly have is a community, uh, let's say they're uh, all a member of, of a faith organization and you have this faith organization, uh, be it synagogue, mosque, church, what have you, uh, doing a community solar program for their uh, parishioners or what have you. You could have lower energy costs for all of these people coming from this one project. If you multiply that out, now, instead of just one house, which is hugely important to get that conversation going, now you have a bunch of people talking about how they're saving energy on their electricity through these community solar programs. And we've seen this proliferate uh, across states, uh, particularly states like Minnesota, uh, Maryland, DC, New York. I mean, these programs work. Uh, and you uh, have some experience also in the feed and tariff program, right? Out in yeah. California. Why don't you talk about that for a second? Because that's, right. a, that's a, just another way, right? Yep. And we can come back to community solar. And I can, because um, we're doing another program, I can talk about a program we're working with in New York. It's a two megawatt project with the public um, housing. Exactly. Authority. Yes. So, those kind of projects. Let me, let me um, make a note so I don't forget this. I'll talk about the feed and tariff program, and then talk about the community solar. So the feed and tariff program, and actually there's a video. It's called Clean LA. I'll send it to Dustin. I might be able to put it in the chat room if I can get off here for a minute without losing everything. Well, we'll uh, definitely put it in the resources tab. You send it to okay, me great. and uh, once Perfect. we upload this uh, to our website, we'll put it there. Perfect. So I was in LA when they started setting up the um, feed and tariff program. It was There's a group called the Los Angeles Business Council. They're still functioning. I they just had a, a web, webinar not that long ago. But during that period of time, um, the big the largest municipal 
water power authority in the country, LADWP, they weren't necessarily as excited about this as they should have been. So it took a long time, but a lot of groups coming together. Um, solar industry manufacturers, pol um, solar manufacturers, the module manufacturers, the um, community organizations, um, all came together, um, obviously environmental organizations, et cetera, to move the city to support the development of a feed-in tariff program. And a feed-in tariff program is essentially a program whereby for utilities to build a big plant to provide power takes a lot of money, a lot of time, and sometimes years of planning in advance. But for them to secure additional power, they were able to do this by utilizing existing rooftop space. And so what they would do then is a business owner, say they had a very large rooftop, that rooftop would essentially be rented to the utility. Utility would site a solar power system on the roof, and that rooftop owner would be paid money, not a credit, but actual a check. And this would be over a period of about 20 years where they would be paid either a ongoing source of funds, which you could get possibly a little bit more, but in smaller amounts, or a one-time upfront fee for allowing the uh, utility to site the solar power system on your roof. Now, what this had the effect of doing was also creating additional jobs because now this increased, increased the demand for solar installations across these large rooftops and they even got down to some smaller commercial rooftops as well. A specific example I can give you is that this one didn't go through because the owner had property and it was trying to decide whether they wanted to sell it or hold it and then the real estate was going up. So they decided eventually they didn't do it. But this is the, what they could have done. Um, had they gone through with this, they had about 100,000 square foot roof, right? So big building. Um, and so what we're going to do is do about close to a megawatt, about 900 kW of solar on the rooftop. Um, their roof needed to be replaced. So the roof wasn't in good shape. Um, but even with that, they were going to get a check for like $100,000. This is with the feed and tear program. And their roof will be replaced for well over 200 plus thousand dollars to replace the roof. So you're talking about well over 300000 plus dollars that they would have gotten a check. If their roof was good, they would have just got the check itself. Um, but since the roof needed to be replaced, some of that money had to replace the roof, and then they also still would have uh, received a check. This is with the feed in tier program. So the solar goes on a roof. The roof, rooftop owner essentially rents the space out. The utility pays them. Utility now doesn't have to build a, a facility way far out somewhere. They just connect right into the grid that's connected, that's right next to the building. They can feed that electricity in and then provide it to their other customers. So this is the feed in tariff program. It, at that time, it was the largest feed in tariff program in the country. I believe it still is because they've expanded it because it's been such a, you know, so, so highly and well received in the city. So very large program. There's all kinds of information about it. And the video that I have, this clean LA program, we're actually in it with a lot of people that you know, like um, actually the, the executive director of the Sierra Club, uh, Al Gore, um, the mayor of the city of LA and all these other people were in this because it's sort of for a lot of people working to put this program together. So that's the feed and tear program at the city of Los Angeles. Now, the, another example of this is a partnership that we formed several years ago with a group that is doing a community solar project with the New York Public Housing Authority. It's about two megawatts. Um, they've actually started the first phase of that project. So this is starting. And since they also are a social mission driven company, we've formed an actual partnership to do this. They are actually going to create jobs for residents there. They're going to reduce the cost for those people in public housing, all those residents there to get like 10% reduction in their cost. And it will create a stream of income for the, um, for the housing authority. And so they're utilizing this as a way to help to provide and bring resources back into communities using solar power projects to do that. Um, and if it was a company that was not a social mission driven company, they would just take all those funds out. And so these are different ways that solar is being used for larger projects. And so a community solar project would be great for something like this, like in the state of Delaware. In fact, we've already begun to have some discussions about bringing the same program here to the state of Delaware based upon an existing working model, not theoretical, in the largest housing authority in this country. So that is being done. And it's, they do have access to the social 
um, impact fund of a large an investment group is the social impact component, which is set aside specifically to do products that are going to bring benefits to communities. So these are the kind of things that can be done at, on a larger scale. So we think that by doing that here, and I'll give you another example of this same pr program. We, we had a meeting with the university um, and this project was gonna be also around a couple of megawatts of solar for this university, it was in Maryland. Um, what they would have been able to do is to save like $40,000 a year. $40,000 a year would have been the stream of income from this project. And that means over a 20 year period, you're talking about 800,000. And they would have received $40,000 a year to invest in a project, not to go into university coffers, but a project connected to the university that was serving the community. If they had a daycare program or some other program that was working to provide service for the community. So you're talking about $800,000 that they would have saved and then $800,000 that they would have been able to uh, feed into a project working in a community. That's on about a two megawatt uh, base size of the project. So these are the kind of things that can be done. We can do that here in Delaware. And we do have a project proven, demonstrated. So we're really excited about being able to bring that here and you'll hear more about this as we move forward. And um, we'd love to work with anybody that's interested in doing that. And part of this is gonna be getting a policy in place that makes it more doable, uh, like a real community solar program and project here. But we can still do elements of this even before the legislation is passed, if for some reason we run into some, some hurdles with that. But those are some other Good. examples. Yeah, and uh, for those that wanna learn more about community solar, we do have an event cooking uh, that we're working on with uh, Green Building United, to, uh, which is another great local organization. Uh, well, actually it's a, I think a regional organization, but they have a, a section here in Delaware. And um, we're hoping to educate the public and uh, legislators and, and uh, other elected appointed officials on what community solar is how can we get community solar here in Delaware? Because you just see, when you open up the doors for community solar, you see an explosion of solar. Every state that's done it has had, uh, you know, solar expansion in their state. Now there are other things that we, you know, we would have to adjust on uh, how we do solar here in Delaware to make it really work and really make sure that we're doing it in, in an equitable way, uh, which is vital. Uh, vitally important. Some of the states have really struggled with making sure that it's done equitably. Uh, just as an example, some states require, you know, a certain percentage of low and moderate income on every project, but then you have situations where there is, there's a community solar project that, let's say, is in Upper Brandywine. You don't really have the percentage of low and moderate income folks there to meet the requirements, and then no project gets built. So that you got to fine tune the ways that work in each state to make sure that you're getting the equity and the results that you need to get and make sure everybody can benefit from. So we're having some really great conversations right now on community solar and we hope to, to share that work and that effort and hopefully be successful next year so we can get projects like the housing authority uh, exactly. one done here in Delaware, you know? And, I mean, and the thing about it, we, there's financing to do this. So we're not even yes. saying states give us money. It's like, right. we're already to finance. We just need policies that make it work. And I think the other Get thing- out of the way, more or less. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah exactly. Just a little help, a little help. And also um, factoring in the employment and, and baking that in. So the things you talked about there, the equity, the employment factors and supporting uh, an environment to grow training. There are, there's a technical center. There's also could be community based. We've done some work in the training arena. I'm on a yeah. board of a group now that this, this another state. They got like a million dollar plus grant to do one of the first uh, programs of its kind in the country at a high school to train from 10th to the 12th grade in solar. We can wow. do things like that as well. But if we can tie that to like this project we're talking about here that we can do with others community solar tie that to the training so that it's very the connection is made very real right just have a project have people train and then they work on a specific project so these are the kind of things that we're very interested in want to get done here um and i think are all doable and some of the things even before that there is um group purchasing so we know that if we get many people coming together just like if we do 40 kw we can do a free system for a low-income resident if we can do larger groupings of people who want to do solar, even without a community solar program, we can bring costs down to make it even more affordable 
to give a specific um, targeted savings to each of the participants in the program. Those are things that we can do just by communities coming together. And I think the other thing is to maintain the community in community soul. Yeah. Because it's talked about in many ways. You could just have a big company come in or you can have utility companies. I was just reading an article today about a utility not only doing community solar, but they essentially want to basically take over the community solar arena and say, well, we'll do a big uh, solar installation and then you can buy into this, which that kind of nixes the community and also takes away the ability for communities to determine how they're going to control their energy usage. Yeah. Because it begins to start moving. And the workforce. Back. There's a lot of different ways communities can have input, right? You can also have workforce agreements, community benefits agreements, something you yes. know a lot about. Yes. We're doing that. that. I think that's essential, um, both in terms of the hiring and the training and the some of the specific numbers, how and who is going to be doing the work, that it's local hires or at least the percentages of local hires. These things can all be worked out. It's in the interest of a municipality or a state to have some of that in projects. I know of some large projects that are happening in the state now where you don't have that. And so you see most of the are a significant portion of the license plates are in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and other places. Nothing wrong with that. People need jobs everywhere. But states need to ensure that they're not doing huge projects and a significant portion of the jobs are not local. That doesn't make sense. In fact, when we were talking about the feed and tariff program in Los Angeles, one of the things that we Went and spoke before city council. I was there with others and we spoke, et cetera, et cetera. Is to some of the city council people were saying, Are you mean to tell me that all these projects are going out and we're not hiring local people because a lot of big companies were doing the work, but they weren't hiring local. They bring their own crews. So it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So those are things that, you know, in terms of fine tuning it and then making sure that those companies are accountable in some way to, to really focus on getting local people employed and that we do have an infrastructure of training programs that are aligned with that. So it's a comprehensive approach and it really takes a, a change of mindset so that municipalities and state elected officials, et cetera, are thinking about how do we transition the economy on the ground? How do we put the wheels on the idea car? And these are some of the wheels that make it work in a very concrete, and, and some of these things can be done even without legislation. But as you mentioned, we absolutely need strong legislation because I know, um, and I've mentioned this before, having a person who wanted to do a project and invest in the project, but they just went to New Jersey because the programs were just so much stronger. And, it, and it's something that didn't have to happen. It was yeah. more like, they have a good program, we just don't at this time. Yeah, and we're gonna fix that. With your help, we're we're gonna gonna fix with it. all your help watching uh, out we'll there. It. So I really appreciate you uh, taking some time out of your day. I know you are you got a lot going on. You need skipping back in you know they're back in the classes and uh, so I really appreciate you taking the time today uh, so if, if somebody's interested in, in uh, getting an Amani project going how do they contact you okay it is um, J Richard Sun just the letter J and then Richard Sun at ImaniEnergy.com and that's Imani as in the Kwanzaa principle that's a whole nother discussion, but it's I as in ice, M as in Mary, A as in apple, N as in Nancy, I as in ice, energy.com. J. Richardson at imanienergy.com. You could even call me if you like. Um, it's 323-919-3203. 323-919-3203. Um, yeah, and I didn't even talk about our mobile solar training. We're actually in a one of the largest STEM and science festivals in the country right now and, and virtually, we have a virtual booth and I'll send you the information on that. That's gonna be until October 31st where we are using this as our first entree um, to show people what we call the mobile solar experimental system. It was developed uh, by two PhDs at UD. We actually, uh, actually got the rights to do this. And so we're gonna be looking at in the future assembling these and utilizing these for education. That's another one of the plans on the docket, but we invested in that. So now um, and probably once some of this COVID clears up and we get in a different uh, situation, but to be able to do more work in the area of STEM education. And we've done trainings, like I've done trainings in New Jersey, working with other groups that are doing um, STEM education around science and specifically around solar, because we know that 
getting young people engaged is also an important way to get parents to think about this in a different way as well, because youth are, they're high energy and they're very, very uh, capable of uh, making their case for things. And so it's important that they're engaged as well. Absolutely. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get the resources when we upload this on our website. You'll have all the resources that uh, Jeffrey talked about today uh, will be up on our website. So it's sierraclub.org slash Delaware slash live stream series. Uh, each word separated out by a hyphen. Uh, if you go to our, our main website, there's a tab for events and outings and it's, it's under there. And so uh, next week we'll have Lisa Locke joining us from Interfaith Power and Light to talk about the Climate Conversations Program, uh, which is uh, a program funded by uh, the Delaware Sustainable Energy Utility. Uh, and then we'll have, we'll actually have the uh, SCU on the week following. So keep an eye out for all of our upcoming episodes. You can see all of our past episodes on the uh, live stream series landing page. Again, we just wanna thank you so much, Jeffrey, for for joining us today. It's always a pleasure. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Again, reach out. We have all kinds of things going on. We'd love to just interface. And I thank you, Dustin, for your commitment, all the people at Sierra Club and others for doing this really important work, connecting communities. I know that we can do this together. It's been done other places. We got powerful, great minds, committed people here. We're going to get it done. So I thank you for this opportunity to share today, and I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right, guys. Have a good one. Take care. Thank you.